The economy moving again, growing 400,000 new jobs, fostering 10,000 startup businesses. Friends, Virginia will be open for business. It's time for Virginia to be the place where everyone wants to live, not leave. For analysis of this race and other major elections around the country, I want to bring in Joel Payne. He is a CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist. And I also want to bring in Jennifer Nassor. She is a Republican strategist and former chairwoman of the Massachusetts Republican Party and founder of the Pocketbook Project. Um, thanks for joining us, guys. Jennifer, I'm going to start with you. Um, so, you know, here's the really interesting thing about the race in Virginia. Uh, the former president, uh, Donald Trump, endorsed Glenn Youngkin throughout the race, even though Glenn Youngkin, I won't say he distanced himself, but he, he let's say, well, he didn't campaign with the former president. Let's put it that way. Um, so this is what uh, former President Trump had to say. He released a statement last night congratulating Youngkin and thanking his base the former president's base, for voting for the Republican candidate. And he also said, quote, the MAGA movement is bigger and stronger than ever before. But was it actually the Trump base that elected Yunkin, or was it something else at play here? Well, first of all, good morning, and thank you so much for having me. So there was definitely something else at play here. So Yunkin did not run with Trump, nor did he run against Trump. He ran as his own candidate. And the best line I heard last night was from Reince Priebus, former chairman of the National Republican Committee. And he said, Yunkin is a happy warrior with a happy spirit. That is the kind of candidate that is needed and that Virginia needed. He ran on kitchen table issues, and that's what won. Uh, Joel, uh, exit polls also showed many groups who voted for President Biden in 2020 voted for Glenn Youngkin this time around. Biden won Virginia by more than 450,000 votes last November. So why did so many people flip this time around? Well, the suburbs giveth and the suburbs taketh away, um, it seems like. And I think I, I mostly agree with um, Jennifer's point about Glenn Youngkin. I think he was probably the only type of Republican that could have won that race in Virginia. I think it's also important to point out Glenn Youngkin could not have been nominated for a gubernatorial or Senate uh, Republican nomination in many other states around the country, uh, in Ohio against a Josh Mandel or a J.D. Vance, um, in a Michigan and a Wisconsin and places that have really gone deep red Trump. I don't think Glenn Youngkin uh, is, is a viable candidate. And I think that's also important to remember, too, candidates matter and matching the appropriate candidate to the appropriate appropriate political environment matters as well. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say is uh, maybe, you know, uh, surfacing a quote from Dr. Joyce Brothers when she said that uh, people are best persuaded on an empty stomach. And I think Republican voters were really persuaded because they're out of power, just like Democrats before that, when Donald Trump was riding high on the hog as the, uh, as the president and as the leader of the Republican Party. Democrats were motivated. Republicans were motivated last night, and they certainly will be motivated in the 2022, which presents a big challenge for President Biden and his congressional allies. So the race really tightened towards the end. Um, CBS News exit polls show that the issue of education and the say that parents have over what their kids learn in school was a very important issue for those who voted for Yunkin. He had, you know, an ad that he ran basically addressing that specifically. Now, Yunkin has pledged to ban critical race theory in Virginia schools, which should be an easy lift for him, considering it's actually not taught in Virginia schools. <laughs> so. Um, so I, I got to ask you, Jennifer, why did this issue of education resonate so much with voters this time around? Well, so I'm a mom. I have three daughters that are in school between grades four and 12. I think I should be in charge of where they go to school, what they learn, and be able to talk about issues at home with my kids. I don't want them being taught things in school that aren't aren't giving them a diversity of thought. So it's not that it, we should be um, 
telling school boards what to te teach our kids or independent school boards what to teach our kids. It's more of teach them everything. Let them learn. Let their young brains soak in the information. And then when they come home, it gives parents an opportunity to then have those conversations with their kids, but not that the school is taking it on. And so what Yunkin did was his message resonated with parents because we are in charge of our homes, we are in charge of our kids, and big government needs to stay out of our homes, which is why he also resonated with those libertarians. So, Joel, based on McAuliffe's laws, how concerned are Democrats heading into the 22 midterms? You sort of alluded uh, to that uh, earlier. And on the flip side, I guess, Jennifer, um, does Glenn Youngkin, I know, Joel, you say that Youngkin could not have won in a deeper red state, but on the other hand, I'm wondering if by distancing yourself somewhat for, from President Trump, this opens a path for people who may be considering the presidency um, in 2024, like, for example, a Mike Pompeo or a, 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 a Mike Pence. So, Joe, first. I guess, yeah, yeah. Let, let, me, let me maybe start. Just I'll try to answer your question. I just want to address something that Jennifer said. Um, I, I do think that um, you know, Democrats are going to be concerned going into 2022. Democrats exist on being concerned. We we were concerned uh, before the surge the last couple of weeks. We've probably been concerned since Election Day, and that's the world you live in when you have a 50-50 razor-thin margin in the Senate. But just to kind of frame back on the critical race theory issue for a second, I think Anne Marie's lead-in was appropriate. It's not a real issue. I think the real issue is about education, and it kind of actually relates to COVID which is that people were frustrated about the 18 months of being um, you know, remote learning and not being able to send their kids to school. I think that that was a stand-in, that was a proxy, the critical race theory fight for that. But um, Democrats have to accept that bad faith, cynical uh, political ploys like critical race theory can be deployed successfully. And that's what Republicans in the form of Glenn Youngkin did. But I do think it's important to underscore that that's not a real issue. It's a red herring issue. It was successfully leveraged and successfully manipulated by Glenn Youngkin and the Republicans. But that's not a real issue. And I, if I was a Republican strategist, I wouldn't quite lean on that as a model all across the country, because I think they were able to find an inside straight here that they may not be able to find in other parts of the country. Um, so let's let's <laughs> yeah, you know, and, pivot and back to well, Vlad's question, which I thought was yeah. a really interesting question, Vlad. If you know, if there are candidates, and we did see sort of a rash of candidates for a while there in various races that were sort of sh shaped in the image of Donald Trump, and they didn't actually do all that well. And so now you have Youngkin, who's presenting something a little different. And actually, I'll go back to the the whole issue of critical race theory, which kind of was thrown out there. And it, and it certainly seemed to me like Youngkin kind of backed away from it, even though he said he would ban it from schools, and kind of like reconstituted it into this like parents should have a say in what their children read. They shouldn't have to read Beloved if they don't want to. Um, that it is a more uh, refined argument, palatable argument for some Republicans than kind of the bomb throwing um, candidates that we had kind of seen before. That maybe this will be... Um, Opening up the the opening up the landscape for a different type of Republican candidate, Vlad. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that what you were kind of trying to get at? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm curious, Jennifer. I, I sort of wonder if by threading that needle, in other words, embracing some of the policies that uh, President Trump and let's face it, those around him, like Mitch McConnell, espoused um, uh, the conservative justices, um, you know, the strong military, you know, lowering taxes. Um, is that a path that a moderate Republican can track in a national election mm -hmm. if you distance yourself slightly from President Trump? In other words, you distance yourself from President Trump, the man. Joe points out that it's in the suburbs that these battles are being fought. A lot of those suburban voters perhaps liked the fact that there are conservative justices that President Trump appointed, but didn't like Donald Trump at all. Um, and so they voted for Joe Biden, but now they've got a guy who is not Trump-like um, in, in behavior. And so that guy is easily digestible for them. And that could be something that can replicate, can be replicated across the country if another Republican chooses to challenge the former president should he decide to run in 2024. 
So 1000%. So let me just go back on one thing that Joel said. Joel, I don't know if you have kids that are in school, but speaking as a parent in a blue state, I can tell you 100,000%. Those kids are being taught critical race theory and they're being taught other issues that are not issues for school. They are supposed to be taught at home. So that's just number one that I do want to correct because unless you're a parent and you have school age kids, you really cannot talk on this subject if you live in a blue state. So I'm just gonna put it out there for that. As far as the candidate, the greatest thing for me about Glenn Youngkin is yes, it gives the Republican party an opportunity to look forward, to look down the road, to see different candidates, to break away from the rear view mirror of the Trump administration and the Trump persona. Again, what we need are more candidates that are talking about policy. Get away from looking at the person, look at the policies. The Biden policies and the progressive policies are killing the country. So what Glenn Youngkin did was talked about those kitchen uh, table issues, the economy, jobs, education things that actually resonate in everyone's homes. And that's why he won. And what I hope to see going forward in 2022 and 24 are more of those candidates that can resonate with voters and with everyday people. Joel, let me just uh, have you kind of respond to that. I, I mean, I, I, I will say that perhaps the way critical race theory is being defined by different groups um, might lead to a misunderstanding. But critical race theory, as it is taught in college, is not something that elementary school children learn. But Joel, I'm just gonna let you respond directly to that because she called you out. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. No, I, uh, Jennifer and I can have an honest disagreement about that. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't have school age children. I am a product of public schools, however, and um, I understand how the issue can become demagogued. Uh, so that's that's fine. And Republicans are going to they're going to do a victory dance today. I, I guess my caution to my Republican friends is don't overreach, uh, because I think if you do, I think you're going to find yourself surprised that that's really not like when people dig deep and they understand to Anne Marie's point that the actual critique of critical race theory has been a bit bastardized in this environment. I think we're going to find that maybe the experiment in Virginia can't be replicated all across the country. I think the experiment that can be replicated that Republicans will try is to radicalize or weaponize education because of the frustration around COVID. So we, we can have an honest disagreement on that. Yeah, I'll just add, and before so, but, we move on to talk about some other things, that, you know, Joel, like you, I also attended uh, public schools here in New York City and some Catholic schools. Um, and I don't recall, you know, parents coming to school board meetings to protest the asbestos that was in the walls of some of the schools that were built in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Or I don't recall anybody showing up um, at a PTA meeting when I was sitting in a science class and a teacher actually suggested that the reason African Americans are stronger and faster at playing sports is because of slavery. I mean, you know, it's interesting to me that, and that's anecdotal, obviously, but it does strike me that if you have a, a, a megaphone and you repeat something over and over again, um, people start to believe that something nefarious is afoot. And the question, of course, is, is it really nefarious? I guess it is, is the question. I understand that parents want their children to be taught certain things. But again, going back to when I was in school, you know, the way that the Civil War was presented to me is not the way that it's being presented today when we talk about the war between the states. I'll give that to anybody. Oh, to well, listen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'll take that on. I might be the oldest person on the panel here, um, but I also went to public schools in New York. Um, and it, this was not an issue back then, because back then, and, and I'm sorry, maybe this is not politically correct at this time, but back then it was, we don't see color. Everyone is the same. We're one nation under God, indivisible, right? And for some reason, that has now diverted. And so maybe when I went to school, it was too close to the civil rights era and everything had corrected itself. And now today, it's we need to see all the differences in everyone. And so what is happening in schools is that that is being promoted in schools instead of parents having a say in it. And so I think that, again, as a parent and looking at my daughters and looking at their education, 
I want to be involved in their education. I want to have a say. I also want to know what they're learning. So that way, when they come home and they tell me what they're learning, that they're learning pronouns in school, I want to have those conversations with them. And it's not up for the government to decide. That is the whole message. So it's it's policies, right? And we have to be careful because Joel and I, I think can agree on this in the overcorrecting on either side. Because right now it is the AOC and Bernie Sanders side that is controlling the message on the Democratic side. And the last thing that I think centrist Democrats want is for that messaging to switch all the way over to the right and then be in control of Tom Cotton. And so I, I think that you know we we all need to have a say in what goes on. And that's why elections are awesome and democracy is amazing. Man, Jennifer, I wish I could have a whole hour-long conversation with you, but we have to go on to another really interesting race that's uh, happening. Uh, New Jersey, listen, Joel, you said, uh, you know, you're cautioning Republicans. You're not, you may not be able to replicate what happened in Virginia elsewhere, but then we look at New Jersey, and, you know, certainly the Democratic incumbent, the thought was that he was going to be far and ahead, and now the race is too close to call. What do you make of what has happened in New Jersey? Yeah, look, this is shocking. I'm a, I'm a New Jersey guy, uh, Union County. Uh, my first job in politics was working for the late Senator Frank Lautenberg. I know that state very, very well. Um, this is incredibly surprising. Um, I, I will say, if you look at some members of that New Jersey congressional delegation on the Democratic side, they have been sounding the alarm bells related to taxes, particularly um, you know things related to the inclusion of the SALT um, provisions within um, a potential infrastructure package. And that has been an issue nationally that I think um, has been attempted to be reflected, um, you know, on the local level. And I, I guess what I would say is, look, surprises happen. We do know that Democrats have historically had a difficult time being reelected at the governorship in New Jersey. Um, historically, um, in my lifetime, you know, Jim Florio, Jim McGreevy, uh, folks like that have not been reelected. So if Phil Murphy is able to hang on and survive, he'd actually make history as a Democrat. Um, so I think that might say something. But look, this is uh, this is probably, frankly, more of a surprise than what happened in Virginia. If you were reading the tea leaves of Virginia over the last month, that was not that shocking last night. What's going on in New Jersey with a razor thin margin for Governor Murphy is really, really surprising and probably is more of a sign of uh, concern for Democrats nationally. Really fascinating. Uh, we so should point just, out just to kind of put a little. I want to ask you, Joel, because there was a similar strategies, right? We saw a lot of Democratic heavy hitters go to Virginia and also go to New Jersey. And for a while there, we were asking, well, why is the president showing up in New Jersey when this seems to be, you know, a shoe in for for the incumbent? Um, and then we saw, you know, in both cases, the Republican candidates really focus on more local issues. We talked about what was happening in Virginia, um, in uh, New Jersey. You know, there was a focus on the economy. Um, and the impact of, of the pandemic on the economy. Um, is there a lesson in there for Democrats? Yeah, the lesson is, thank God they did send the heavyweights there, because if not, uh, Jack Chitterelli would be probably uh, giving his victory speech this morning, as opposed to what looks like Phil Murphy may survive. They needed every single vote. Um, I was on this airwave previously earlier this week, and I said New Jersey is much more of a turnout environment than a persuasion environment for Democrats. I still think that's the case. I think the goal for having those heavy hitters in market is to spike enthusiasm. And they needed every single vote in Newark, in Camden, in Elizabeth, in Atlantic City. They needed all of those votes to turn out in order to give Phil Murphy a chance to hang on to his job. So one last question uh, for you, Jennifer, before we wrap this up is, you know, I'm curious about you know, going back to the question that we had uh, uh, over how Republicans can thread this needle without uh, b displaying some of the behaviors uh, that the former president displayed, what would happen in a world where somebody does decide to challenge President Trump? And I know it's a little bit ahead, but I, I know people are thinking about this now. If President Trump decides to run for the nomination in 2024 and other Republican moderates 
choose to challenge him. What happens when the former president starts to suggest that the election results in primary contests are rigged? I mean, what then? In, in other words, there's a lot of talk right now. You're seeing all the headlines are Democrats in disarray. Are Democrats pushing too far left? Um, what do they need to retool? But I also wonder, you know, as we think ahead down the line, what it could look like for the Republican Party if there's infighting between people that are full-on Trumpistas and others who are like these voters in Northern Virginia who are moderates, suburban, suburbanites who, who voted for Glenn Youngkin. So I hope that we don't have a big party fight. I hope that what we do have is good, honest discussion where the Republican, whoever the, the candidates are on the Republican ticket, I hope that they take a look at what is happening in New Jersey and what happened in Virginia and remember that this is about policy. This is about failed democratic policy. If I was in the White House today, I would have to take a serious look. Nancy Pelosi should really be having conferences with every single member on her side today because the Republican wave is coming. And so the Republican Party needs to be very smart about this, and they need to be very savvy about this, and they need to be a little bit calculated in making sure that we stick to old school, traditional Republican values that we're talking about the economy, that we're talking about jobs, that we're talking about foreign policy, that we're talking about education, that we're talking about issues that affect every single family. Every single person who's out there voting and living in America needs to hear that we are actually the party that wants to help. We want to lift people up by their bootstraps. And we've gotten away from that. And so it became a Twitter war in 2015 and 16. And so get away from social media and start talking to people and meeting them where they are. And I think then we can have good, honest conversations. Really, really fascinating, illuminating discussion. Uh, and, yeah. and Jennifer, I think I'm the oldest one here. I was born at the tail end of the 1960s. So... I love that you thought that I wasn't, <laughs> but <laughs> come back on any time. Uh, Joe Payne and Jennifer <laughs> Nasur, thank you both very much for a great discussion. Really appreciate it. Thanks. So you can get the latest election results and local coverage, not only by looking at the bottom of our screen right there, but also uh, by heading to our CBSN local streams. Just download the free CBS News app or head on over to cbsnews.com live.